people will die. It might be you. It might be your mate. It might be the brand new guy. It's going to happen at some stage because there's lots of bullets that fly around or there's, there's dangerous work that we do. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. They were building positions in there if for a fight. If anything happened to us, by the time anyone got to us, I think it was chaos. the weather was so bad, there would be no to run to boots full of blood. And the next thing I hear was alarms screaming. The chances were very, very slick. The soldiers didn't want to go into the ambushes, so yeah. they'd send the kids in first. Yeah. So he was sent in first into an ambush and he got shot in the stomach. It was very hard for me, very hard for my family. And the pain was Proud of the pain. crew. Proud of what I've achieved and what I'm doing. To volunteer for service was, in effect, to put your life on the line. On September 2nd, 2008, in eastern Afghanistan, Trooper Mark Donaldson of the SAS made a split-second decision that would change his life. His extraordinary display of courage saw him awarded the Victoria Cross for Australia, making him the first Australian to receive our highest award for bravery since 1969. I had the privilege of sitting down for a long conversation with Mark. We recorded this chat at the Cronulla Golf Club. Mark and I spoke about his early life and what drove him to the SAS, deployment stories, the Victoria Cross, what it means to have a VC, and life after. I'm Alex Lloyd, joined today by Mark Donaldson, VC. Mark, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks very much, Alex. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Let's start with your family, Mark. You've got some military history there, most notably your late father. Yeah, yeah. My dad was a Vietnam veteran, serving with 176 Air Dispatch. Funnily enough, he volunteered before he got conscripted, was I guess his story for Vietnam. So 176 Air Dispatch, now known as mainly riggers uh, these days, and certainly back then it was the same sort of thing. But they worked a lot I guess for, for what he did, it was a lot more closely with cargo rigging, so rigging up underslung cargo underneath the Chinooks, primarily and underneath the Hueys, but you know, a wide variety of things, less parachuting back in Vietnam days uh, than what it is these days. He uh, did see some stuff, though. He saw a death by friendly fire. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he was, uh, I mean, look, I don't know the ins and outs too much of the, the actual event, but I know there was a, I guess disgruntled, maybe that's not the right word, but there was a... Troubled. Troubled, yeah, who, who walked into a, the sergeant's mess or the messing tent, threw a grenade in and, and I believe let off some shots as well. Uh, at which stage I know uh, my dad had seen him just before he did that event or just before he went and did that, um, that action. So, you know, I couldn't imagine that happening these days, to be honest, I really couldn't. But, you know, back then it was, it was a different time, different reasons people went away and, and, and different reasons, I guess, why it might have affected that guy, but... Yeah, so as far as I know, that you know, it probably did affect my old man to a degree, you know, having seen such a thing and trying to process why someone would do that. But yeah, I know he uh, went to the inquiry when he came back. That was a bit of a big deal, the court case and, and things like that. Not, not from a media perspective, but you know, for, for him and his own you know, life, I guess. It was a big deal for him to have to go and do that uh, and be a part of that. He would have then had a mixed feelings, mixed attitude towards the military post-war. Yeah, for sure. Um, my old man was kind of funny because I remember distinctly remember you know he he was against the military he was against the army as an institution or certainly what it stood for based off his vietnam experience maybe more so the way the government said no you're definitely going away you know without choice so to speak and and the, the irony of that is that he volunteered before he had that choice taken out of his hands I, I think that's the way he would have seen it but in that though is a funny thing about about his own personality is that um he was very soldierly in his ways uh, and certainly throughout the, that i knew him throughout my life albeit short but you know he used to wear his army greens around he wore his slouch hat nearly every single day so a bit of a mixed bag there yeah, yeah right. it's a bit bit of an irony almost but i think even the way he went about business so waking up early and keeping everything meticulously clean those habits never went those away. habits right yeah um you know those sorts of things always working hard do what you say you're going to do sticking to your word um, integrity those sorts of things so i think a lot of that was born out of his military time however against the actual institution itself and how old were you when your father passed away? Yeah, I was uh, 15 years old. He passed from a, it's a massive heart attack, essentially. Collapsed one of his lungs and a few other bits and pieces. I won't go into the gore of it. Uh, so my mother was working a doctor slash dental surgery in a small town that we grew up in, Dorigo, New South Wales, North Coast, up in the mountains. So he went into there saying he had you know pains in his chest and things, went to see the doctor. Uh, they put him in the dental chair and, and 
the doctor gave him some medicine and then from what I know it, it hit him again uh, and then yeah he passed out in the chair they, they tried to do CPR but they couldn't bring him back and that just left uh, you your mother and your older brother yeah that's right yeah that's right so my mum went from being a, a wife and a family to um, found herself thrust into being a single mother with two teenage boys you know one away from home and one one at home and you weren't exactly a structured teenager either. You didn't have an interest in joining the military as a kid or anything like that. You were a bit directionless early on in life. Yeah, for sure. Um, now, I was about as far from a stereotypical idea of, of going and joining the military. You know, probably in a way, you know, it's almost on reflection, you sort of look at the way my old man was and the irony of how he was with the Vietnam War. But we used to run around and play wars all the time when we were kids. And we used to love running around out in the bush and going and doing adventurous things. But the irony of that is it was when you look at what I did, it was almost a perfect uh, upbringing to go and join the military uh, and to go and do those sorts of and types of activities. Yet, you know, the whole nature of the attitude was anti-establishment, right? So um, the military would be the furthest thing you would think of actually going and doing. Let's jump ahead a bit. As I think we'll see during our chat, your life is defined by a series of crossroads and that is something you've used to define your life later on yeah and at these crossroads you keep making the right choice that leads you down this path i think your first major self-determined turning point was the morning after a supremely drunk night out in sydney the one where you fell between uh, the train tracks <laughs> yeah yeah so that was a big night i guess it was just that uh that youthful exuberance of excessiveness right how far can you push something how far can you stretch your challenges you know how, how much can your body take you know, how much can your mind take and that was kind of i guess wrapped into substance abuse so to speak and um yeah it led to an event where i was heading the wrong way on the train to where i actually wanted to go because i was too uh, inebriated to, to figure that out uh, I fell between the train and the train track itself and stuck between the train and the platform luckily enough the uh the guards on duty you know managed to see that and they actually didn't take off on the train thank thank goodness otherwise i would wouldn't be here but yeah I, you know next morning i decided that that was that was it right uh, i can't keep can't keep that up otherwise i'm going to end up six foot under something's wrong here i need to make a change yeah exactly right um and and you know what that was was maybe take a bit of a break from um testing yourself from how much you can drink and party to maybe there's other ways of enjoying life before you fulfill that change of direction though and join the army something else quite significant and horrific happens tell me about what happened to your mother i was i was living in sydney i'd moved out of home by then going to university well technology university and uh studying graphic design and also working part-time in a kitchen and I hadn't spoken to my mother for a few weeks so I rang up and a family friend answered the phone which is not sort of really uncommon for a small town right and certainly not her friend they were really tight often at each other's places and she'd asked you know have I seen my mum and I said no I hadn't uh, you know why well, would have I um you know, six seven hours drive away and she said yeah we're not sure where she is what's happened to her uh, you, you might want to come home so I, I, you know, caught a train, started hitchhiking, got to my auntie's place, and they were heading up to up to the town where, where I was from. Eventually, got there and went to the police station and sat down with the policeman and a few detectives, and and they said, uh, "Mark, we think your mother's been murdered uh, due to the nature of the evidence that was found at the house and the fact that she's missing. She wasn't, she didn't check into the hotel on the Gold Coast. She was supposed to have a holiday, you know, et cetera, et cetera. She didn't get on a flight, and that led to, you know." A series of things additionally to that a young friend of the family was staying at dorigo at the time and he was staying two days a week at the house because he was working up there on a, on a construction project and you know he showed up that morning and, and saw that you know something wasn't right and found what was left in the house and yeah the the blood stains and things and and to this day she still hasn't been found coronial inquests and things over the recent well not to, not about 10 years ago now but uh, over recent years sort of established that that's what they believe had happened that, that she was murdered uh, and they think that the guy that that did do it killed himself two days after she went missing and, and he did leave two suicide notes but neither of those uh, mentioned anything about mum or where she might be or, or what had happened so yeah yeah to this day she's she's still classified as missing and, and there's still a cold case in and around there and there's some amazing people that that i know still um tap into it every now and then and, and see if there's any been you know any new information or updated information or anything that they can do to try and uh, find out where she is but uh, you know there comes a point in time when you got to go well you know it doesn't matter how much looking you do or how much searching you can do that maybe some people just aren't going to be found for whatever reason so uh, that for me back then being 19 years old and you know coming off the back of uh, all this partying and, and you know excessive behavior was a real i guess it was an amazing opportunity and turning point in my life to be able to really look at it and say you know it becomes a choice right and i could have chosen to let those events and particularly that one make me become a victim and blame it you know blame those things that had happened for 
for the rest of my life, so to speak, and, and and go, you know, that was really, really crappy what happened. And anything that doesn't work out for me now in the future, I, I can blame it on that. Or which what I chose to do was look at it in another way that this is a gift, right? And I could become a product of this and, and what's happened has happened. I can't change that. There's nothing I can do to change that. There's no going back, right? And it's like when you join the military and you learn at some stage when you pull that trigger that, that once that bullet leaves that barrel, that's it. You can't take that back. So so it comes a time when you just got to get on with life. And, and that's what I decided to do a couple of weeks after that event. And it might sound a bit harsh and, and, you know, doesn't take away from the fact that I certainly think about my mother most days, but there is no going back. You know, she's gone and it was time to move on. And, and you know, at 19 years old, it was a point of, okay, what now? What's next? What do I do now? And, and it gets a bit deep and maybe a bit silly, but uh, it was almost like, okay, what am I really doing with my life? What do I really want to do? Do I continue down this path of, of going to university and not really doing the things that I enjoy, I'm only doing it because it seemed like a good idea or it seemed like something to do because it fulfilled, you know, that uh, expectation that you've got to go to university and get an education and all those sorts of things. Um, whereas when I really looked at it, it wasn't really what I wanted to do. I wanted to go and check out the world. Uh, you know, growing up in a small country town, your world's quite small, but you don't realise that until you leave it and you don't realise what you had until you leave it. And uh, I, I wanted to go and see what the world had to offer, right? Just so happens it took something like that all those things happened and then that was a bit of a trigger, I guess, to kickstart that, um, that attitude of let's go and see what's out there. So between that immensely traumatic event, it's easy for me to make guesses with the benefit of hindsight about you know, why you joined the army, direction, purpose, new family. Are all those what coalesce to make you go and put on the cams? I mean, reflection, like you said, you know, hindsight's a, an easy thing to then decide why people decide to do things. However, try and remove all that bias and all that hindsight. And I think back to when I, when I truly decided that, you know, there's something that looks like the military that I really want to do. There was kind of two events. One, I was living down in, in uh, Jindabyne with my cousin. And unfortunately, our house burnt down uh, one day when we were up at the hill. Well, her house burnt down, I should say. That event was a bit of a catalyst because it forced us to have to move and do something. And for me, that was... At that time, I was like, you know, I, a few things had happened and, and I wanted to help people. For some reason, I had this thing about, oh, I wanted to help people. I wanted, I wanted to do something that seemed like it had a purpose. And you know, I was looking at things like firefighters and police, emergency services, and they just weren't taking it at the time. They weren't hiring. And then that pushed me to go back overseas to the US and travel again, work over there. And whilst over there, I got this bug about wanting to serve. And just before that, arguably one of the biggest, <laughs> one of the biggest events in the last 20 years, but September 11th had happened. And that was just before I flew overseas. And I remember coming home and watching these two planes flying to these buildings on the TV. A couple of days after that, I was flicking through the newspaper and I saw this picture, right? It was a big double page spread. It said Special Air Service Regiment. And there was this picture of this guy. You know, he was in this black outfit and he had this web webbing on with magazines in it and a gun and there's a bit of smoke behind it. And for whatever reason, I just, it was like, I call it a primal cue, right? So I was already looking for something and this just happened to appear. And for me, it was a, that seems like, what I want to do. I don't know what it is. I don't know how to do it. I don't know who that is, right? But I want to do that, right? I want to, and I read this page and I looked at it and I said, I want to do that. And there was a mate who was at my brother's house where, where I was reading this at the time and he was in the Royal Australian Air Force. And I'd said to him, you know, mate, what's all this stuff about? And he said, oh, it's really secretive. It's in the army. It's in the military. You'll have to join up. You've got to train really hard. They blow things up. They, they dive off submarines. They jump out of helicopters. They do all this stuff, you know. He goes, you don't want to go and do that. And I was just in the back of my brain going, mate, you got to be kidding, right? Like, who doesn't want to do that? That just sounds awesome. That sounds perfect. That sounds like a real adventure. And I learned kind of two things that day. One, that's definitely what I want to do. I want to go and do something like that. That seems like the right path. Join the military. It's a challenge. In a strange way, it's a challenge like all the, the substance abuse and the, the excessive behavior, right? It's a challenge, but on the other end of the scale. How fit can you be? How tough can you be? How smart can you be? How skillful can you be to go and do things that someone says no one else can go and do? So that's almost like a bit of a red flag, right? You know, that can't be done. Well, I'm going to give that a go. There was a bit of that. And then the other thing I learned that day was that people in the RAF don't know much about the military. And uh, <laughs> I say that in jest, but for all my RAF friends. RAF former friends. RAF former friends, right? They are now. Uh, and it's fun. Look, it's fun. as much as I'm joking, they are good people. It, uh, it, it really solidified in me that, you know, it, it, there's an aspect to the military that even the military don't know about because it was something he didn't want to do. And for me, I looked at it and I thought, well, if you're in the military, surely you'd want to do that. Okay, there's, there's something special there. So then I went overseas and I did still work in, in the snow for a little bit. So it's like, yeah, when you want to buy a new car and, and whatever type of car it is, but you never really noticed them before on the road. Yet all of a sudden now, because you want one, 
you start to see them everywhere. But it was kind of like that. So when I was in the States, you know, I just kept bumping into people that were, had been in the Rangers or that had been in Special Forces or that had been in the military. I started reading all these books about it. I started training when I was over there in the snow. You know, I was reading all these British Special Forces and SAS books in particular and getting training programs and, and thought, well, why wait until I apply? Why wait until then before I start training? I may as well start training now. What better place to do that in the, in the middle of winter, in the middle of Utah, up in the mountains when it snows, you know, a ridiculous amount and it's really cold. And so I just started doing that. I started training up there. You know, I was running around in the snow. I'd, I'd get up in the middle of the night and go training. I was still having a good time, mind you, um, because I'm, you know, you're in a snow town and you know, parties happen. But you're starting to make the transition. But I was starting to make that. You know, like I said, I'm a slow learner, right? And so it took me a while to get there. But everything I started focusing around that. And then it got to a point where I, I applied and I said, you know, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to join the military. And, and then I had to come back a little bit early because I needed to go and do those interviews to, to join up. So you join up, we'll skip basic where you do very well. And to when you arrive in Perth for the SAS selection course, your welcome to the course was to strip naked with 139 of your new best mates. Yep, pretty much. That's, um, that was it. And, and I remember it's not what you've been born with, right, that you're worried about. For me at that time, it was, it was my flat feet right, that I thought I had. And the doctor would walk around every single person, they'd look them up and down and they, they're looking for injuries, right? Well, there's two parts to it. One, they just try and make you nervous. Uh, and and then secondly, because they're just trying to make people, they're just, they're just trying to eliminate the people that don't need to be there straight away, right? Sometimes standing in a, a large hangar that's cold in the middle of the night, nude, people don't want to do that. As much as they might want to do the other part of it, they don't want to do that. And that's that's enough for some people to get broken. And they, they pull the pin there. And then when he came around to me, you know, he was looking at my flat feet and he was asking me about them, whether I needed orthotics and did they give me any knee dramas or ankle dramas or hip dramas or back dramas. Uh, and luckily, that, luckily at the time they weren't. So it's pretty off-putting, to be honest. However, you start from scratch, right? There's not much else that you can go down from there to put everyone on the same playing field. You're standing nude in a room with 140 other people. You know, there's, there's you kind of, you feel... Um, and pardon the pun, but you feel kind of small, you know what I mean? And, and, and I'm not trying to be funny here, but you feel insignificant. They're equalizing you, putting right. you at the same starting point. Yeah. So everyone's at the same baseline. So from there, it's up to you. It's what you bring to the party from there. There's no competition off the bat. No one gets a leg up because of, for any other reason, because of where they're from or whether they've done other things in their life. It doesn't matter. You're all starting there at the same point. And the uniform doesn't matter either in that sense because you came as a private and applying to become a trooper, but if others came in as a lance corporal or corporal, they lose that rank. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they are still a lance corporal or corporal for that period of time over the selection course. However, if they, uh, they make the selection and they get selected and they get continuation training, so to do further training on that reinforcement cycle, they, when they get posted there, they do relinquish all that rank. Uh, we had a sergeant on ours that, that went back to being a trooper. You know, That's just the way it happened. So again, yeah, like you said, everyone starts from that base level doesn't mean we don't remember what they've done and we don't ignore the fact that they have that knowledge you know that's just a benefit that's a bonus but everyone goes back to that base level to the disappointment of some listeners i'm not going to get you to go through the whole selected experience <laughs> of becoming a trooper uh, you've documented it very thoroughly in your autobiography which we'll get to later and it would take a whole podcast just to tell those selection stories. But let's do a quick overview and a couple of specific anecdotes. Let's start with the three hellish weeks you go bush. Yeah, so it's a it's roughly three week course because that's what it is. It's a course, right? And the reason I say that is because people see it as a, an all encompassing thing. And once you do those three weeks, you're in. And it doesn't work like that. It's a course, so you still like any other course in the military, you have to perform. You're expected to reach a certain standard, and if you reach that standard, then they'll consider you for further training that's really all it comes down to is do you have the attributes or do they think you have the attributes based off that three weeks of um, observing you to then be considered for further training so really quickly there's a lot of team-based activity uh, and there's also a lot of individual activity so you've got to be able to switch between the two very quickly you've got to be able to understand what's important and what's not you know the team's extremely important and at all times it's always about being a team player yet you know, there's also the aspect of being able to do tasks on your own as directed as required. We used to speak a lot about the grey man, you know, you've got to be the grey man to get in. A lot of people mistake the grey man with being the guy that is just really quiet and, and doesn't contribute and they think it kind of slips in. It's not really that. The grey man is the person that just gets on with the job. The grey man is, is the guy that is there at the end and you kind of go, you know, I haven't necessarily recognised this person, but I know they've contributed. And they're the sort of person you want on your team when, when things get tough, right? They're not the loudest, but they're not the quietest. 
they're very, very good at applying themselves to everything. And there'll be some things that they're really good at and some things not so much. But that to me is the gray man. It's the one that's completely dependable, completely reliable. And you know you can trust them no matter what. Really quickly though, like really good snapshot is you do a lot of individual activity, then teamwork, then individual, then teamwork. And it slowly whittles people down. Last five days though is probably the hardest or five to six. You're working 24 hours a day essentially. You're carrying really, really heavy things for 18 hours. It takes six to eight grown men to carry. You know, no food, no sleep, and this just goes on and on and on. And what it does is it's made to strip you down as individuals and as team members to see how bad you really want this and how bad you're going to put yourself on the line for other people when it really matters. That's what it's all about. But the biggest thing about the selection is not the physical. It is, as you sort of touched on, the psychology. You go in with 140 and 40 from that group will finish the course. And one of the most self-grueling tests in your mind I can imagine going through is that NAVX at the end of it where you're just plonked out in the middle of nowhere and told, you know, go it alone and good luck. Yeah, for sure. And that's, you know, that's one of those individual tasks where it's, do you have discipline? And people talk a lot about discipline these days and, and what it is and what it's not. And that's an example of, of where you need self-discipline to structure your day and understand that You've got to get up at this time. You've got to walk, walk this many kilometers. You've got to reach this checkpoint and you've got to continue to push yourself with no one giving you any motivation or assistance or help. That purely comes down to a mental game because it gets really noisy out there on your own. It gets really, really loud. And what I mean by that is there's so many voices inside your head, lots of people, and I'm not, it's going to sound like I'm someone with multiple, multiple personalities, but that's what it's like. You, know, you have these crazy conversations in your head about whether you can do it, whether you can't do it, and we're going to keep going. Or you've got the discipline to go, there's, there's a one-track mind, right? I've got to do this no matter what. I've got to do it. Um, I don't care if my legs are hurting, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm getting scratched by these trees, I can't push through this bush anymore, uh, I'm sick of walking over these sand hills, I'm really tired, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you just got to have that discipline to crack on. Yeah, that discipline is an aspect that that how you measure how do you measure that? It's measured in the amount of kilometers you do and the decisions you make on that process. And you might say, but there's no one there watching you the whole time. No, there isn't. But you can judge people's decision making process based off their progress. When was the last time they t- they hit a checkpoint? How long has it been since they've had a break, had a stop? How much water are they filling up at these checkpoints? So it shows a lot about how much they're using, which shows a lot about their mental state. And there's a lot of little underlying things there from an observational point of view as a, as a directing staff or the people that are um, observing and then judging whether they're good enough to, to, to be a part of the ranks or to make it through that next cut. But it's tough. You've got to be comfortable with your own skin. You've got to be comfortable with your own voices and you've got to, you've got to be happy to do something on your own. Otherwise... People don't get scared, but they just get lonely out there because they're so used to doing things in teams, especially in the military. And again, that's where it comes down to that discipline. And a lot of that happens well before you're even on that course. If you haven't done that work before you get on that course, if you haven't put yourself in those situations, for me anyway, then it's going to be so much more difficult uh, during those periods. And just to put the button on that, you also finished that NAVX two days early. I did all right for me and I was happy with that, you know, and I was lucky enough and I wasn't sure they were telling the truth, but they said, and it's one of those little moments, right? When things are really tough and this applies to anything. It just happened to be on this, this um, example, but when things are really tough, it's really good to celebrate it when you do something well. And I think it's important to do that because it's often we just go, okay, I've ticked that box now, let's move on. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is the directing staff at the the station where they stopped me said, oh, look, you know, you've done enough, sit down. And I, I thought, you know, oh, no, I've done something wrong, right? Is this a test? Or? Is this a test? Yeah. Do I just keep, do I just ignore him and keep walking? But I was assured that, you know, everything's okay. Just rest. Uh, and they said, you can go for a swim if you want. And we're at, we're at a place called Lancelin in WA, which is a, a few hours north of Perth and full of sand hills and, you know, the, the general environment, the marine environment can be a bit harsh. So I went down to the beach and stripped off and Went and jumped in the ocean, which was awesome because I was covered in ticks and bites and fleas and whatever else from being out in the bush up there. But yeah, just to jump into that salt water was, you know, it felt like uh, I could wash those, those five days off, right? And, and felt reinvigorated and ready for the next whatever it was they were going to throw at me. So you've gone through all that, but it's not over. As you said, you had to keep going and you know, people are still being dropped in the next stage, the reinforcement cycle. Then you've got medical SIG specialization, close quarter combat training, air, land or sea insertion training. It's relentless. Yeah, it is. It is. It's, you know, depending on which insertion course you take, it can be up to sort of 14 months long, this bit of training. And really that's the learning phase. All you've done at the start is shown that you're willing to be there. 
they were willing to be a part of it and that you're trainable. After 14 months, some people are still After 14 dropped. months, people are still getting dropped, you know, and that's, that's a big deal, right? And things have changed a little bit now. You know, there's better processes now than what there was certainly when I went through. And, and what I mean by that is there's opportunities to come back and give it another go or give it another test. But even then, you know, it seems like a, that's a big investment to drop someone, right? And it is kind of rare that at the end of all that, they, they get dropped. It would be based on they haven't performed through the whole course. They've only just maybe got their neck over the line on every single thing. And then right at the end of it, they, they might have failed again or they might have um, not reached the standard, sorry, not necessarily failed. Because let's be honest, it's not really a failure, right? 95% of the military will never do that, let alone attempt it. Happy to be called out on this, but I heard a quote the other day that more people succeed in, in summoning Everest due to the access they have nowadays, right? each year then people do pass selection and go through that reinforcement cycle so yeah that's great because we're talking about a globe versus one nation right but it sounds good um, but it's really hard and so to get through all that and then still maybe not make it would be absolutely crushing that's what happens guys have their dreams absolutely crushed because they go through all that they put themselves through blood sweat and tears and then they still don't even get to do it however they shouldn't see it as a failure they've succeeded in so much that many others wouldn't have Probably the biggest thing that's changed over the last couple of years, definitely the last decade, is how we reframe that. Probably 15 years is how we reframe letting people understand and getting them to walk away from that process going, you know, hey, you're actually a pretty big success when you think about it, what you've done anyway. So don't walk away from this, albeit dejected, yes, but you've done an amazing thing. But now the flip side of that is the ones that do get through, as we call it, or we used to call it, which for me is, you know, it almost conjures up this notion of survival right i just got through it or i got through it whereas it should be more of around i've learned i've been through a learning process an upskilling because that's what it really is so you shouldn't get through an upskilling you should have gained knowledge you gain understanding and, and change behaviors to now be able to do the job that's that's going to be asked of you to do but it's a long process right um, and it's an amazing one well you make it you upskill your sas trooper mark donaldson you initially go to the Middle East on personal security details, including for Prime Minister John Howard. But let's go forward to that first operational deployment in Afghanistan. Yeah, sure. I guess one thing I will touch on with the PSD, though, is, and I certainly don't want to focus on the negative because it was an amazing deployment. But the nature of what that deployment was, was, I guess, the essence of, of how it works sometimes in we hadn't been training as a team day in, day out. We were smashed together from different squadrons. We were brought together from different positions across the regiment to go and achieve that job. And you've got to be able to do that. That's why that individual aspect is so important as well as that team aspect. You know, team above anything else, right? And unfortunately, due to, due to you know, circumstances that, that happened on the training and the build-up, one of the guys got killed in the training accident over in Kuwait when we were building up to go into Iraq and Afghanistan with John Howard and, and the other people that we were looking after there. I think it was the defense minister and, and one of the chiefs at the time. Yeah, you know, early on in your career, you learn, whilst we weren't necessarily at war, we're going into a war zone, you learn that good people die. That's the course of what happens. You sometimes can't control that and you need to be at peace with that. That's something that anyone who I think steps into those roles, and some people get upset when I talk about it like this, but, and, and I'll certainly highlight that I'm not talking that you shouldn't grieve and that you shouldn't be, have feelings for it when your friends die or get killed in action. That's, of course you should. But what I'm saying is there should be a, an understanding and a conscious thought process around people will die. It might be you. It might be your mate. It might be the best person in the squad. It might be the brand new guy. It's going to happen at some stage because there's lots of bullets that fly around or there's, there's dangerous work that we do. You've got to be at peace with that. Because if you're not, oh, and me personally, you know, I'm only speaking from my own experience, I think is that when, that's when things can get difficult. It's the mental skill to be able to say... It's conditional and that you can process the fact that that's going to happen and you're prepared for it. It's a preparation thing. Right? You're preparing yourself mentally. Otherwise, it's going to be a shock. It can happen to any of us. It sucks. It really, really, really sucks. And there's no really good way to describe how much it sucks. But it happens and you've got to be prepared for it. And, and it just so happened that I experienced it on that trip, you know. And it was only a training accident and that's all it really was. But it wasn't good. But what I took away from that was a learning process a learning aspect that it happens right? and you got to be happy with that so then you know the next year following the first operational deployment you know and, and it was very much long range reconnaissance you know this traditional so-called traditional role that, that the regiment does because we like to pigeonhole because it makes it easy right and, and i'll touch on that you know there's so many more things that we do it's not just long range reconnaissance 
special reconnaissance. It's called special reconnaissance for a reason because there's many different ways to do reconnaissance. Well, you inherited that label somewhat from the Vietnam War, but over the course of the Middle East deployments this century, the SAS evolved hugely what they do. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, And so they should. Because if we're taking it from the Long Range Desert Group, the LRDG out of World War II, or we're taking it from the reconnaissance guys out of Korea or the reconnaissance guys, the small team reconnaissance guys out of Vietnam, which did an amazing job. Everything is about the patrol. That's the core element of what that place is, and it should be. But you should be able to scale up and scale down as required, right? That's what makes it special. It's that modularity, that adaptability, and that flexibility to be able to do so. Whether it's scaling down to one bloke, one person, that might not even have to be out there. That might be using technology these days, right? All the way up to, as we were in Afghanistan, sometimes it might be up to 30 people. Let's talk about your uh, learning curve in Afghanistan. This is your first major operational deployment and your first one as not in the infantry, your SAS. You've gone straight to this elite level, so you've had all this incredible training, but it's still that first time learning curve for you. Yeah, so uh, I, I think what's really important is to understand that I was super excited to be there. I, I trained so hard to do that job. I wanted to be there. I wanted things to happen. Get the opportunity to go and test my skills and put myself up to that challenge to be able to say, yeah, I can do this. Maybe my expectations were too great. And sometimes it felt during that, certainly during that first deployment that I didn't really get that opportunity. But in saying that on, and looking back at it in reflection, you know, there was lots of times where we did some really cool stuff. You know, some of the, the reconnaissance work we did was awesome because we were out there for weeks and weeks and weeks on end and they didn't know we were there. We were able to, to do some really good things and create really good effects where we'll be able to call American aircraft in or British aircraft in or French aircraft or whoever it was up in the sky to be able to come and, and, and apply the ordnance and the effect we needed onto the enemy picture to disrupt those networks, to break them apart, you know, and to gain intelligence based off that. Certainly one patrol when we were out on the vehicles for quite a long time, we were, we were sort of in these little wadi you know, halfway between the mountain and the valley and... and we were there for 10 days straight, I think, in these vehicles and quite a lot of people. And we had a little commando mortar element with us as well. And they were excellent in providing fire support as well. And the ability to be able to just remain hidden, you know, it was, it was kind of cool. You know, there's something really, really cool about and really fun about being so close to your enemy yet they don't even know you're there, right? It's like playing schoolboy war uh, and you're hiding in that one spot, you know, down the river or whatever it is that no one knows and you're watching people run past and they don't even know you're there, you know. There's elements of that that are amongst it but it's real it's funny you're um this uber professional but you're also fulfilling that slight little childhood fun of this is cool 100 percent, right 100 percent. and and i think it's really people go oh, that's really unprofessional it's human it's human right it's human and it's not unprofessional what's unprofessional is not acknowledging the fact that you bloody enjoy it because that's going to drive so much more behavior than if you just stonewall it and say no i'm just doing my job well we do just do our job doesn't mean you can't enjoy it you know, and I've been guilty of it in the past, is to say, no, it's just our job and we're not supposed to have emotions around it. Being happy about it is an emotion. You don't let that emotion overtake you though, or you don't let that drive other things to make bad decisions. But acknowledging the fact that I enjoyed it, I think is really important for people. Because I know a lot of guys that bloody enjoyed it <laughs> and, and, and so they should, because it's bloody fun. But, you know, there was other things in, that, in, in those trips where I did get to engage the enemy, albeit from a bit of a distance in some of those early ones. But, you know, there, there was times when you know, when really strange things happen where we had the ability to, we had the ability to understand and then listen into the enemy's communication. So that really gave us a leg up on, on where they were and they would describe themselves in these positions that are really obvious. So where you're sitting there looking at a village and there's only one double story building with a big tree next to it, of course, they have to tell their, their own teammates where they are. So they would say, yeah, I'm in the tower. I'm in the tower with the tree. But when you look at the village, there's only one tower with one tree in it, right? And they just straight away give their position up. Now, that's all a part of warfare, right? That gives us the advantage, gives us the initiative, and we act on that, as you should, because you want to gain it and maintain it. There would be times when they would do things like that, and then they would get engaged. They would be talking to their mates on the radio saying, oh, they know where I am, and, and, and come and help me, and then a carload of guys would show up, and it wasn't our team, but the other team managed to engage those guys as well, you know, hitting that car full of fighters with a rocket and, or two. I joke about it, and I say there's funny things that happen, and we're talking about taking lives, and it's extremely serious. And I have the utmost respect for those enemies that we came across because at least they stood for something, right? They believed in something as well and, and they were willing to do something about it. I think that's better than people that, that have apathy, that don't care, nor do they want to do anything about it anyway, right? So I have more respect for a fighter than, than someone who has apathy about the situation because, you know, they had a crack. But, you know, some of those early fights and those early contacts were, were good. Were, it was a good learning process, right, for what, what was you know, going to happen for the future. 
But sometimes things would go wrong for you on those operations. On your 2008 tour, you had a Black Hawk Down moment. Yeah. We were conducting a night mission to shape the enemy, right? So the idea behind this one was there was a pretty serious IED guy in this valley and he was creating a lot of problems for the local guys, a lot of problems for our forces. Really good at laying IEDs and, and setting people up. So the idea was to go in there at night on our Bushmasters and we're going to drop patrols off along the way. So we would have our guys all in place along the road because what his, what his opera, or modus operandi was to follow a convoy and switch on his IEDs behind them because they're already in the ground. They place them through the winter. They just sit in the ground. All they do is go and connect the wires and turn or, and or just switch them on, right? So that's what he used to do. He used to trail along in a motorbike behind them and switch them on. So when the convoy generally would come back the same way or come back a similar direction, probability of hitting one much higher. So the idea is that we would try and ambush him as he was trying to do this. So that's why we're dropping patrols off. The other thing we were going to do at the end of it, which my patrol was, was in task, not but my actual patrol, but the trial I was in, was tasked to do was when we got to this place, we were going to an, a well-known Taliban safe house, so to speak, that they used to use as a, as a place to sleep. We we're just going to go check it out. It, it, it's what we used to call an enduring target. So it might not be a, a really time urgent target that might pop up straight away and you go and prosecute. This is one that you might just come and revisit over and over again because you know it's a historical place that they they um, they use. They, they set patterns of life, right? They go back to the same places. So we were going to go there. We're going to go check it out, see if we can catch anyone out that might have been there and or um, create an event with some um, flames and some explosions to wake everyone up, to get them talking. So then he's going to come out of bed too, right? And come and take action and we'd already be out there. He'd managed to either have one switched on before we got there or, or yeah, it had just been an IED that was, that was just there as they tend to be and just leave them switched on. And we hit an IED uh, on the vehicle that I was on. It was the Bushmaster, which, you know, I credit for saving my life or at least my limbs. To date, no Australian has died in a Bushmaster. They're amazing vehicles. There you go. I didn't know that stat, but yeah. When I last checked anyway. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think they saved a phenomenal amount of life because... It's great to have speed and mobility in a light skinned vehicle, yet it, it comes without security, right? So there's a payoff. When we started using the Bushmasters, we found other ways to get speed and mobility out of them. And again, that comes down to just using a bit of Aussie ingenuity, right? But what it gave us was that protection. And we hit this IED and I remember it was nighttime, so I had my MVGs on, which are night vision goggles. So what they do is they draw in all the ambient light and essentially allow you to see in the dark. Not as good as daytime, obviously, but really, really well. And we had pretty decent technology back then as well. It was almost cutting edge. So the ability to see was, was not a problem. Uh, I remember just a, a, a flash right, of white you know, through my MVGs, it just light. And it, it, what, what it does is it flares them out or blinds them out. So they just go all, all white, essentially. At the same time, I remember flying through the air and then everything went black because my MVGs were, were flung off my helmet. I remember just, just spinning. I remember thinking, we've just hit an IED because I was flying through the air and I had this, this, this moment of, okay, I'm still going up, I'm still going up, I'm still going up. You know you're kind of high because you get to that point where you reach your apex of flight and then you pause for a little minute and you kind of hang in the air. It's as, as like when you're jumping off a, a trampoline, right? You go up and you sort of pause and then before you come back down, it's a really big jump. And so that happened. And I was still spinning and I thought she wasn't going to hit the deck soon. And I was still spinning and, and still hadn't hit the deck. Still hadn't. And then, and then I hit, what I think happened is I hit the front of the Bushmaster first, bounced off that, hit the dirt after another couple of somersaults. And then it sounded like the car was still moving. I thought it was still driving, right? So I thought it was going to run over me. So I started to scramble and roll out of the way and I ended up in this ditch like 20 feet away from the vehicle. And everything was black. And the first thing I was expecting was gunfire being a, a asymmetric warfare and an ambush. They usually follow these things up with, with some type of attack, coordinated attack anyway. Not only was I waiting for that, but I checked all my bits as well, right? So I grabbed my feet and all the important parts of your body uh, that you do, uh, made sure that everything was there where it was supposed to be, and then jumped straight on the radio because the radio transmissions were starting to happen. Everyone was doing a check-in. was one of the things we do as soon as there's a blast. Every call sign checks in, right? Two things, find out who's actually coherent and on the radio, and whoever doesn't check in, you know that they're either not getting the comms or they can't talk, right? And one of the guys couldn't check in. And he was the other guy who got blown out of the back of the vehicle and he ended up in the blast hole. Luckily enough, you know, the guys, they came and responded and, and some guys went up forward and they found, they found the guy who you know, was sitting there with his mobile phone trying to set off another ID that was in the wall next to us, uh, that was right next to the Bushmaster itself. So what he was trying to do was, was um, hit the first responders. So they blow up the first IED that damages the vehicle and gets whoever they get out of that. They wait a few minutes, let the first responders, so your medics and your, your, your other teammates come and respond to the wounded guys. As they get there, usually next to a rock wall or, or, or a house or whatever, right? Sometimes even still in the ground. When everyone's around then, they hit the next one. And that way they get double bang for your buck, right? <laughs> to put it in those terms, they get, they get double the damage. 
And that's what he was trying to do. Two things. Luckily, we had technology that was jamming that and it was stopping that from actually getting through and setting it off. And the other one was that the guys that were out front who had converged on him, you know, stopped him continuously trying to set it off. So then there was the process of dealing with my mate who had ended up in the blast hole, who, you know, it, we found out later had, had fractured his spine. So I had to get him on a drip, get him uh, on his stretcher. And then we called in a, a pav hawk, uh, which is a, a US version of a black hawk almost uh, that's, that's decked out to, for medical reasons, right? And, and as we do, we set up a perimeter because, again, middle of the night, still worried about being attacked. Everyone started to wake up at this stage in the village, so they wanted to come and check out what was going on, what had happened. And so we called in the pavwalk. It showed up close to midnight. It did a couple of laps. We threw a strobe down for it to come and land on. And over there in the cultivated paddocks, it's kind of like a corrugated iron effect. So you imagine a tin roof, corrugated iron. The paddocks kind of look like that, that, that rose, those valleys and troughs. And when it came in initially, it got browned out. And what that means is because it was so dry and dusty, Lots of lots of dust would just kick up every time the helicopter would come in. And it is ha- dusty haze. Right. Yeah, yeah. And it's nighttime too. And the pilots are under MVGs. They're not using spotlights. They're not using anything to assist them. This is so they're not drawing attention to themselves for the enemy. Right. Because you imagine a helicopter shows up uh, in the big middle of target. the target with yeah. big lights on it. That's a, it's an easy target, right? Yeah. So there's a bit of self-preservation for the platform there as well. So he came in once, twice, still didn't manage to get there. So we shifted the, the landing point a little bit. And as he came in on the third time, he came in kind of sideways. So imagine instead of landing with the rows of the corrugated iron, if you can picture that and you're sort of running with it, he came in at an angle and sort of hit sideways. So it was really bumpy for him as he was trying to land. As such, it kicked the helicopter up right in front of us, like I'm talking probably five meters in front of us. It flipped onto its side, so the rotor blade itself was facing us as we were standing there with our wounded mate on his stretcher. So there, you imagine four guys standing around a stretcher and one guy on it, and the medic who was, who was sort of there in there as well. So the, the helicopter's kicked over, rotor blades are jamming into the dirt, it's throwing dust and rocks and huge chunks of rotor blade were tearing off it. It's crashing right in front of us loud loud right loud really loud just chaos uh, i remember seeing through the dark because i managed to get my um, night vision goggles back by this stage uh, big chunks of, of things whirring past like rocks and things flying past it's hitting us and i remember seeing the the helicopter kick back up on kind of onto its feet and then it started to i guess what you would call auto rotate so that the tail rotor sort of swung from the left hand all the way around away from us and then coming back towards us to the right hand side and it was actually swinging around towards us so it was like we're going to get whipped it's like it's doing a donut in the ground right. yeah exactly right and and you know like a dinosaur or a lizard whipping its tail right like and it's coming around really quickly and i remember i just remember seeing that through this weird dusty haze under night vision goggles it just so everything's just green and black as well and we all took off right we all just started to run away we're like get away from this thing what about the guy on the stretcher so the poor old mate on the stretcher is, is still on the ground and so we, we ran a few meters and we're like oh bugger all right let's let's get back in there and pick him up so as we we're running back in there to grab him i think two of the other guys actually stayed in there and tried to drag him out i remember coming back into it to grab him and this guy comes running past me and he's got a stretcher attached around his waist so he's still strapped to this stretcher he's up and running and there's an iv bag that's in his arm that's dragging in the dirt behind him and he's got a broken back right and he'd just been blown up and and he's just charging out of this this dust yelling out get this thing off me talking about the stretcher right and and, and you know he ran whatever it was 10 15 meters away and eventually stopped so seeing that he was okay i then ran back to the helicopter to see how they were um, when i got there the helicopter had managed to kick itself back up onto its wheels or its feet and then, and then as I got there, they were opening up the door and the PJ had jumped out, the, the uh, American Air Force Parajump Rescue Men. Right? So they're the Air Force guys that jump out and, and come and help wounded people. Awesome guys. So he jumped out and he straight away was like, you know, is everyone okay? You know, I pointed him back to where, where the guy had stopped. I went into the back of the, the Hawk then and there was an Aussie medic in there and, and, you know, the load masters and they were just sort of sorting themselves out. Asked if they were all right and they said, yeah, yeah, they were, they were fine. And then I went to the front of the, the helicopter and then I swear I saw the pilot who was taking his helmet off and he was smashing it against the dashboard, right? Um, just swearing. Road rage. Right, yeah. Just you imagine crashing a, a really expensive car. But a lot more. But a lot more and, and something that you love driving every single day. And you'd be kind of annoyed, right? Plus you're actually going in there to pick someone up. So annoying is probably not the right word, but frustrated, certainly. But, you know, you're lucky it didn't catch on fire and lots of other things go wrong, right? But... But yeah, so then, then we called in for another one and they said they couldn't get one in because of the dust storm that was coming in out of Kandahar. So we, we waited around for six hours for the downed aircraft recovery team, which is known as the DART, Chinook and a couple extra helicopters to fly up, pick us up, then finally get us back to the medical center at Tarrant Count and then go and pick up the downed aircraft. And, you know, the, the, the rest of the mission was essentially a write-off from there. And boys eventually got back to the base some 18 hours later, right? Because it takes a while to 
get a uh, blown up Bushmaster onto a truck and get it out of there and then pick up a down helicopter and, and strip that apart and get it under slung underneath a Chinook and get that back to where it needs to be as well. So it was one of those events that you kind of go, oh, this had never happened, right? Um, you'd never get blown up and then have a helicopter crash on top of you. But you put yourself through those things in training. You go, this is ridiculous. This has never happened yet. You know, strange things happen, right? Well, on that, looking after your first couple of tours in Afghanistan, did you look back on all the stuff you'd gone through with SAS selection and all the various training cycles and go, yep, I can see exactly why you put me through all that. I don't think you consciously look back and go, I'm so glad I did that training. Right? Or, or I really understand now why they do that. It's not for years later, like when you kind of think about it and you go, okay, that's, that's why you do it. But through that training process, it builds up a level of resilience and adaptability that a situation like that, you just understand that it's all about continuing on, right? Deal with it next, deal with it next, deal with it next. And that's what it breeds. And that's why it's so important to have that training the way it is. And touching on the home front briefly, you also met your wife through the regiment. Yeah, so my wife was in the military at the time and she was working in the communications corps and just happened to be working at the regiment and uh, as, as their uh, support attachment for communications to the Special Air Service Regiment. I <laughs> met through that. Uh, and, and for an event like, like that, which happened, uh, for her, it's a completely different thing because whilst I'm over there, you know, all happy and getting to do my job and, you know, I'm excited like I described, but you're going through things like that as well where you're getting blown up and having helicopters crash on top of you and your mates. And, you know, your mates are getting wounded and we'd had a guy get killed a few weeks before that, right? You now, for her at home, you know, she has a couple of people rock around the house, give her a ring and then rock around the house and say, hey, you know, this is what's happened, right? Your husband and his mates have been blown up and then we sent a helicopter out there and it's crashed and we don't know what's going on. That's the last they'd heard of it and they just wanted to keep her updated, you know. Never a good thing thanks to the movies, I guess, um, and, and his history, that when people in uniform rock up to your house and you're a spouse, that it's never good news, right? You assume the worst. You assume the worst, of course you do. So for her, it's just, you know, it's an extremely difficult thing. Luckily enough, I was able to actually phone her and let her know that everything was all right. So she knew I was still talking <laughs> and still alive, but... And everything was intact. Everything was where it was supposed to be, right? <laughs> of course. But yeah, you know, for them being the families and the spouses and things back home, regardless of wife or husband, they go through a completely different process when we're away doing these things. And life goes on back here. Whereas for you, when you're over there, you have all these experiences, yet they're not experiences with the family. They're not experiences in day-to-day -day life. And it kind of pauses, right? So when you come back six months later, your last memories were when you left six months ago. So everything's kind of on pause in your head. And then you come back and, oh, no, actually things have moved on. People have grown up. They've had their own experiences and being able to share that and, and talk about those things, I think are really important. Even played in slow-mo for them back home. <laughs> exactly, you know, exactly. Because they don't actually get to experience what you're experiencing and they have to live, live through what either they hear, what they see in the media or hopefully what they get told when you get back. Talk me through the day, Mark, that would see you awarded the Victoria Cross for Australia. I'll try and keep this first bit concise because there's there's context that needs to be, I think it's really important to understand why we were in the situation we were. So we had been pretty successful in breaking down these enemy networks and chasing down the leaders of the networks and removing them from the battlefield and or capturing them and or forcing them to be ineffective by there's too much heat on them so they get out of the area, which makes it hard for them to command and control their guys, right? Which means that it's less effective, which means that Australian forces and other coalition forces can get on with their job. That's an aspect of what we we're doing, not the only thing. One thing I think is really important to understand is that a lot of the things we were doing then was nighttime work. And, and this particular job, this particular new guy was coming into the area and he just happened to come in probably 80 to 100 kilometers to the east, northeast of where we were, where we were sort of kind of operating out of. We wanted to keep that pressure on. So the minute he stepped foot in our area of influence, we wanted them to know that, you know, you, you can't do that. So it led us to this area, this special forces base we worked out of, this American special forces base, uh, Anaconda. So we went up there to stage out of the base. We went out looking for this guy. We missed him, unfortunately. He slipped um, in the net and where we thought he was and what, what he'd be doing. And we're kind of stuck uh, in the sense that transport was at a premium at that time. We weren't necessarily priority on the list. So for us to be able to call up a helicopter, a Chinook, a transport vertical lift was very, very difficult. So we got together with the Americans and said, what can we do to help out, right? We're going to be here for a few days. Let's do something together. They said there's some pretty heavy areas up to the north, the east, the south, 
and out to the west from the base, but but essentially to the north is where we focus on originally. We conducted a, a joint operation with them where we would use the Americans to go out and do their normal pattern of life, which would um, draw out the bad guys. Every time the Americans stepped outside the base, the Taliban would react and come and attack them. So we said, let's utilize that. Let's let's um, let's strike the weakness and the gap in their capability, which is them not expecting someone else to be there. So when they do come to get you, we'll get them before they get you. Pretty successful, successful ambush. And I won't go into the numbers and the, the details of that. There's probably no need. But from the back of that was exciting. That was really good. Let's do that somewhere else in this valley because that had an effect. Maybe not an enduring one, but certainly a, an immediate one. And that led to this second operation or mission, I should say, out into the valley, out to the east of the, of the base. A little bit further away, a little bit further away from the support of the base. Not a big base, very tiny base. Only man, like by these handful of American guys and their Afghan guys. So the minute they go out and do an operation, the, the base is really undermanned. You, you're talking like, you know, a couple of blokes that are left to look after it really vulnerable anyway so we went out to this valley similar thing right except this time two patrols would hop in the vehicles with the americans which was what we didn't do in the first one we were on foot out in the hills so we still had guys out on foot three australian patrols out on foot but this time two like i said would be in the cars and that i was in one of those conducted the mission was pretty successful again in drawing out the bad guys and, and pushing them into the australians that were into the hills already caught them by surprise right it's just worked really well but at the back end of that is the Americans late afternoon on this day, sort of 3 p.m. ish, heading west into the sun, back through the valley which we'd come because this valley was only one way in, one way out, whereas the other one was a more of a, a loop around a high feature. We didn't go down the same path exactly but because it, it was a pretty decent sized valley. However, we still had to go back through there. And we went back down, we joined up with the Americans and the decision was made to, in that daytime, is to get back to the base. Vulnerability of the base, the Afghans not really having any night vision capability and not really wanting to be stuck out there static for what would be you know five hours of daylight so we headed back through uh, i was on the last vehicle with the rest of my patrol or our patrol not my patrol and uh and so about 13 australians were in was in this group roughly 30 35 guys all up with the americans and the afghans First got attacked from the what was, as we were looking west, um, this is really hard to describe right, for, for people listening, but just trying to give it a bit of a picture. So we got, we got hit from my left-hand side as I was looking at it, or the south, from the green belt, sorry, from the vegetated area where they live, where they have their houses near the river, lots of cover, lots of concealment. We got hit from that angle initially, four different directions, rocket propel grenades, heavy machine gun fire, a couple of um, guys got wounded early, a couple of American guys got clipped. We do and did what we're trained to do, which is fight back. Put down a heavier weight of fire, put down a, a greater weight of fire than they're putting onto you to regain that an issue. Myself, I grabbed our rocket launcher and was running away from the vehicle, firing off the rocket, coming back, grabbing another rocket, running back out. Uh, and then I decided to stay out there and young guy was just joined our patrol. He was brand new to the team, just finished his 14 months of training, 12, 14 months of training. Got a call in like the last, I think it was the last week or two weeks of insertion training. They said to him, you're going overseas to replace the wounded guy from the Black Hawk crash a few weeks earlier, right? The one that was on the stretcher, um, he had to go home. He was coming over to replace me, he was joining our team. We'd only met him two weeks previous, been in our team for those other two jobs. This was his third job. He started running rockets out to me uh, and, we, and we fired off a few of those out there. That's pretty uh, early in his tour for it to get a contact like that. Very early. I'm sure there's a thousand of examples around the world, right? Where the very first day you roll out, you get into something huge. And there's a thousand examples of where people will do years and years in a combat zone and see nothing. Honestly, I mean, you make your own luck, if, if you can call it that. And, and certainly for us, you and, and guys like us, you go and put yourselves in, in places where the, the likelihood of an event happening is going to be much higher. All the same, sometimes it just works out that way. Continue to fight. We moved on this small... No, and we we're engaging to the guys, myself and this very new guy, and we're engaging the guys we could see, the enemy guys we could see in the, in the green belt. We're having a bit of a conversation, a bit of a laugh about it was his third day, um, how soon it was that he'd been amongst it. Now, we shared this little joke about you know, how good it was for him that it was his third day ever uh, outside the wire and he's getting shot at, right? But that's the things that you do and you talk about in, in battle sometimes when you get those moments. For me, it was, it was the humour between us that, I don't know, it settled that down a little bit that we were able to laugh at something in amongst all that stops you getting overwhelmed, stops you getting... You know, a bit too much and then we got hit from behind right between us you know burst of machine gun fire and all the bullets struck straight between us and we were only a couple of meters apart that's when we realized that there was guys behind us as well or on the north side of this valley right in this on this high feature so we had some uh, fast jets or, or close air support come over uh, to drop some ordnance on the ridge line on the north and the guys that were engaging us from up there they did that it didn't slow them down too much it didn't really stop them and you know we continued to fight we're sort of getting hit from both sides as you imagine 
Uh, we managed to get back in the vehicles and start to punch through this valley and get a bit of a break. And then they, the fighting continued and they would hit us from one direction and you know, you'd get out and you'd start fighting from outside the vehicle. It'd sort of get too much and you'd come around to the other side of the car and you'd get a few seconds breather and, and they'd hit you again from this north side. Some cars got it a bit heavier than others, depending on which part of the convoy you were in or which part of that their attack you're actually rolling through. Some significant things happened, you know, this went on for a while. We, we, we took a few guys got wounded, took a few guys out of the out of the patrol. From my patrol in particular, the patrol commander got hit through the wrist, you know, took him out of the fight for a bit. And there's other guys doing some pretty good things of getting people in behind cover who were trying to talk to the planes because the planes are really important and the helicopters, not that we had them there yet, but they're really important in fights like that. Superior firepower, right? It's a gunfight. It's not like boxing, right? You don't jump in the ring and go, well, this is going to be a fair fight. You don't want it to be a fair fight. You want it to be unfair because you want to win it. So if you can get planes up above and they can drop bombs on them, all the more for it, right? That's what it's about because that's going to help you win. And the only reason I sort of bring that up is because sometimes, I don't know, there can be this tendency to compare, oh, yeah, be only one because you had firepower. Well, yeah, so we should. So what? That's the advantage that we've got. So use it. We continue to fight and we got to the point where a mate of mine, uh, and I remember seeing, seeing this happen in the car in front of us, you know, he was, he was getting chased by bullets around the vehicle. As he came around to the front of the car, he got hit through the leg, through his right leg initially, took off a fair bit of his right leg punched a big hole through it, collapsed. As he got up, he went to go to the rear of the car and he got hit through his left leg and he was getting left behind. The car was driving off. He was, he was dragging himself on his elbows, yelling out for that vehicle to stop to help him out. We were behind this. We could sort of see this happening. We were in our own fight uh, and that vehicle stopped. One of the Aussies jumped out and dragged him into the relative protection to the, to the north or to the right-hand side of the, with the vehicle from, um, from the bad guys. Started to put some tourniquets on his legs. Our vehicle saw this. We came up along the other side and provided protection to the south. So it was kind of in between the two cars, giving him some sort of cover. It took us a little while to get there. And then we pushed away from the vehicle, you know, myself and two other guys, to take up a position of protection and having a little discussion about what to do next. Some Apaches have come overhead because they were flying a mission nearby. And I remember lying in this ditch, we're getting shot at, and these two Apaches were flying around. And I was having this moment, you know, not to make this about myself, but having this moment going, you know, I'm actually really scared right now. Um, <laughs> Up until that point, it was, it was just training. It was just fighting. It was doing what you know how to do and you just crack on with it to throw as many cliches as I possibly can at it. I had this moment of realization when, you know, I'm actually scared right now. It was because these Apaches came over the top. They didn't drop any ordnance for whatever reason, following their own rules of engagement, later information that we got. But watching these two Apaches fly out of this valley and knowing that those two things could have completely changed the day and watching these two things fly away to continue doing whatever they were doing and not leaving us there, but... Having that feeling of being isolated and left alone, right? And you go, oh, I went through this process of how do I deal with this? What, what's going to be important? What's next? Am I really that scared? What am I really scared about? And I had to go through that process of dealing with that fear. Realizing that there's fear there, can I control it? It's making me feel crappy. I don't want to feel crappy. I want to feel good. So I've got to not let that fear control me. So what's important? Well, what's important is getting out of this ditch and getting out of this valley and going and helping my mates uh, so we can get the hell out of here and, it's, and see what can possibly be done. Yeah, that's, that's truly what I think is the only thing that got me out of that ditch. And I got up, I went back around, started to help the wounded guy back onto the vehicle and, and to continue on. The next critical wounding that we took, unfortunately, was a mate of ours uh, who was talking to the planes overhead who got shot through his chest. Had the binoculars shot out of his hand, the next round went ripped underneath his armpit, cut through his lung, you know, his liver, a whole bunch of things in his, in his chest cavity. Hit pretty much everything except for his heart and one lung. Came out of his left hip. Extremely serious way. Massive, massive trauma. Stopped the convoy again. The Americans did a great job, the 18 Deltas, so the American Special Forces medics, of releasing the pressure in his chest by putting another hole in it, putting a patch on it, and they weren't going to bring another helicopter in to pick him up. Right? There's just too many bullets flying around, too many rockets, et cetera, et cetera. It wasn't worth the risk. So we put him in the vehicle and, and you know, had to just get the hell out of that valley. I'll fast forward a little bit, but we continue to fight. You know, it got to a point where it felt safer for me being outside the vehicle. Right? People say to me, why don't you just jump in the car and get the hell out of there? Because the cars are a target, but they're also our safety. Now, we didn't know if there was IEDs on the, on the track that we were on or off the track that we were on. You kind of feel like, for me, running around the outside, I had, it's harder to hit me. If I sit on the back of that car, I'm, I'm just a sitting duck. I'm at the whim of the vehicle. And if I was the enemy, the first thing I'm going to shoot at is that car because that's the biggest thing that's there. And anyone hanging off the back of it's a pretty much an easy target. So if I was moving around, then chances of hitting me was a lot less than, than hitting our mates. Yeah, you weigh that up with the speed of getting out of there. You can't really drive fast across that ground anyway. So you're running and shooting, running, running and shooting. Running and shooting, running and shooting, right? Alongside the vehicle as it's driving. Right? Trying to use one side of it at any one time for some piece of cover. And you would move around the other side because the, the bullets would just be hitting around the car too much and 
instinct says get the hell out of there so you run to the other side getting chased by those bullets you know i remember them kicking up at my feet as you're running around the back of the car or the front of the car to get to the other side of the vehicle you get a couple of seconds and then the guys on the north would smash it right and we got to this point where the rockets were coming in and they're hitting the vehicles in front of us and i remember seeing that going this is bizarre right this is stupid they've got that spot dialed in wherever it is these cars because this little tiny waddy in a couple of rocks there it's like a marker right they've had it dialed in for a while they know exactly where to sit and how far to shoot and when to shoot to hit them and a couple of our guys got wounded during that process unfortunately but i remember seeing that and i said to my teammate i'm going to run through that position in front of this vehicle to try and draw some fire and he said okay i'll come with you so we ran through out in front of the vehicles and then i remember the rockets going off i remember getting shot at slid in behind this sort of medium-sized rock that, that two people could just sort of fit behind Bit a little bit of push and shove about who was going to fit in behind it but looking back you know it, it was enough to confuse the enemy so they didn't shoot the car that were alongside that had a, had a few of the wounded guys on it but then we had to get back to the vehicle so we made a mercy dash back to the car and getting chased the whole way the next kind of major event that happened this you know this fighting you know just to give it context went on for this was you know it was a couple of kilometers by this stage that we'd been running and fighting alongside and the next thing that happened is two rockets went off in the vehicle in front of us and blew two of the guys out one being an aussie engineer and the other being an afghan interpreter the aussie guy got up well after a little while the afghan guy was laying face down the car kind of left them behind our car sort of was offset and going past that position at the time and i remember saying to to my mate who was fighting alongside me you know i'm gonna go out there and, and grab this guy this afghan guy we exchanged a few words and, and i said well i'm going so yeah, uh, this guy was this Afghan interpreter who was from the local village, was, was face down in a pool of blood. Didn't know him from a bar of soap, met him five days before. But he was a part of our team and he was getting left behind. And, you know, for me, there's not many worse places in battle you want to be, right? Wounded, injured, getting shot at you know, and getting left behind. I don't care who you are, that's crap, right? If you're in a part of a team that can do something about it, then you should. So, you know, I took off and, and I'm not going to make this out to be anything other than what it was, was... I saw him lying down there and I figured he needed to be helped out, right? But there's no order, there's no regulation or suggestion you have to do this. You looked at that and made the decision, I'm going to go and do this. Yeah, exactly right. And there's an element of parallel in, in training about, you know, doing man down drills and things like that, but it's a little bit different. You don't train for it in that, in that sense. It's always the guys in your patrol, right? It's always the people right next to you. But there's an element of sympathy is not the right word, nor, nor is empathy, but... You can imagine being in that position. And right you know yeah yeah you want to go and do something about it and and you did and i did so i ran out there and i got to him and unconscious pulled the blood like i said around his face and started to drag him um i'm not the biggest guy in the world so it wasn't really working out for me after a, you know a couple of meters he was starting to become conscious so i got my sort of shoulder underneath him and managed to kind of half carry half drag him through the dirt and just started running back towards the vehicle and as it was driving away from us i just remember thinking you know out of all these things i could do with this guy right now do i leave him do i drop him so i put him behind that tiny rock do i put him in that wheel track no what i've got to do is get him back to that car and you know i just focused on that and getting shot out the whole way i managed to get him there but you know <laughs> probably the hardest thing though, to be honest is not not getting back to the car but it was actually getting him inside the vehicle <laughs> Like it was really hard to I would change sides, I don't know, like three or four times, like whilst the car was travelling along and it had entered this part where there was rocks on either side, so it was really tight, almost like being stuck between a train and a platform. Um, you, you're stuck between this this moving vehicle and these this rock wall. And I'm I'm still half carrying this guy trying to open the door and put a bandage around his head and stick him in the back of the car as well. Yeah, it was just bizarre. I eventually got the door open though and managed to jam him in and Came to the rear of the vehicle and brand new guy was there, right? Brand new guy to the patrol. First time we've been in like a major contact and albeit this one an extreme one, I suppose. And he had blood coming down his face. And I said to him, you all right? What's happened to you? And he said, I've been shot, you know? And, and I thought, oh, yeah, no kidding, right? Shot through his head. And luckily it just grazed his skull. Didn't actually embed in. But yeah, clipped him straight through his skull and uh, straight through the, through the top of his head. And uh, There's some gruesome pictures of that in your book. There is some pictures, yeah. You know, he continued to fight. I was, he said, he's all right, he said, he's fine. And, you know, he, he started engaging some guys that popped up near us. And that's the sort of thing that in those moments that you rely on guys like that, right? That's what you expect of guys like that. And that's, that's hugely inspirational. And, you know, from, from there, we continued to fight and the, the vehicles really started to take off on us. And we're, the pair of us were at a full sprint to get back onto those cars. And we finally, thankfully did. And then, you know, we continued to fight from the back of that vehicle the best we could until we, until we got back to the base. And from you know for detail i guess um once we got back there then you go through that triage and we had to man the base because they were talking about overrunning it we still had three patrols of australians out there in the hills that were trying to walk back and and uh and then we had all the wounded guys to do it as well 13 aussies nine were wounded two of us uh, sorry the four of us that weren't two of us had 
you know, I had holes through my pants and, and the other guy had holes through his arm shirt. You know, the Americans wounded, one American got killed. We got a pretty bloody nose. Three aeromedical evacuations that night to get all the wounded guys out of there. The last one that left, it was dark by then. And, you know, every time they came in, they were kicking pallets of ammunition off and we were, we were stocking all the ammo back up and uh, putting these guys on the helicopters. And the last guy that we put on was the Afghan guy that I went and picked up. And that was the last time I saw him. All I know is that he lived. That's all I heard. I heard recently he's, he was still over there. So I don't, you know, I don't know, but it doesn't really matter, to be honest. What's interesting about that, though, is the way, you know, you could go, oh, yeah, circumstance situation, brought all those people to work together like that. I think it's the soldierly qualities, right? The nature of a soldier, regardless of whether you're from America, Australia, or Afghan, is bringing people together to, to achieve that, that, that same mission. For you at the time after that, you recover from that ordeal, the dust settles, life goes on for you over there with your missions. But it's a bit later that the fallout, if you like, from that comes to light for you and the spotlight turns on and boy, does it shine brightly. It was kept pretty quiet. I didn't know about it until pretty much seven days before I was awarded the award. Notified seven days before I actually had it pinned on my chest. So not a lot of time to process it. Now, we, we knew what we'd done. We knew what had happened, but I knew nothing of the talk of the award right there's always talk on trips of people getting awards and medals and things but it's just normal rhetoric you certainly don't think too much into it but yeah i was up i was taking my daughter for an ice cream i got a phone call from the commanding officer of the unit which is pretty uncommon for a trooper to get a call from the commanding officer but it happens um you're either you needed for something or you're in trouble um not really right but it was a good thing and he said come down and meet himself and the chief of army at a, at a coffee shop in perth and we did that uh, and that's when they, they slid the piece of paper across saying you know this is what's been written is what's happened and australia wants to bestow upon you the victoria cross and yeah i don't know that's for me at the time and that's the only thing i can base it off right is if that's the first time you hear about it if that's the first time you get told about it it's how do you process that you don't the biggest thing i was worried about was what does it mean for my career um, that's what it worried me the most at that time Luckily, I had good leaders and, and chief of army, and at the time, and um, the commanding officer, who, who's, in, who's you know, can't say anything but a good word about the guy. He said, "Yeah, well, well, you know, it might change some aspects, but wholly and solely, it shouldn't change anything at all. And you know, you, you were hired, you were selected for a reason, and we want you to still do that." Seven days later, I'm standing in government house. The governor general is pinning the Victoria Cross on my chest, you know, and that's. It was overwhelming to a degree, that actual you know moment. But, but in the same time, you know, I know at the back of the room were a bunch of my mates and they seemed pretty happy for me. But, but for me, it was really a reflection of, of all the work that the guys did that day. I think about that day and I think about the cross and I go, you know what, it's not, oh, it doesn't really matter that I received the Victoria Cross. And what I mean by that is it doesn't matter because what matters the most is, is what we did and because we would have done it anyway. Award or not, we still would have done what we did. And we did it because we're a team. And that's what matters to me. I want to get into your headspace at the time because you are a man of great drive and focused on the mission, your mates, your new family, but you are suddenly a Victoria Cross recipient, the first of the modern era. How did you feel at the time about becoming a public figure? I mean, you meet the Queen, you're at the British World War I generation ceremony, a uh, young Australian of the year, just the circus is just all encompassing in that short window afterwards. Yeah, for sure. Right? And, and look, I'm really, I guess at heart, a bit of an introvert, you know what I mean? I like to be private. I like, I like my own space and I'm not a social, extremely social guy generally. You know, I can be, but we can all do things that we don't necessarily want to do. But it was, it was full on, you know, and it was taking time away from work and it was really, really bizarre and different because our whole point of us doing what we do is that we don't tell anyone about it. We don't thrust it into the media what we do in the regiment, in the special forces. You don't talk about it. You don't big note things that go on. So it was, it was like this huge dichotomy of at the core of what it is that we do. Um, it was an imbalance and that's hard to wrap your head around. It's certainly hard for me to wrap my head around. And um, you know, luckily I had some good people around me uh, in place, you know, being my wife and some friends and, and being able to justify and understand what needed to be done and what was worth doing. One thing I certainly learned was that the institution of the Victoria Cross is much greater and larger than not only myself, but also to a degree, the, the army. I mean, it's been around longer than the Australian army has and the Australian Defence Force. And I mean, zero disrespect by that, but it comes with a level of reputation. It comes with a level of responsibility. You know, I had to understand when was the right times and the wrong times to be who I am in the right situations. And there's a huge learning curve. In saying all that, I still to this day, I'd be lying if I said it hasn't changed the way I am because it has 100%. And I don't know if it couldn't for some people. But in the same token, I, I will never let it change who I am in the sense of you know, being who I am. 
it may change my decisions in certain points in certain places. And it certainly opens some doors for different things. You know, you get to meet all these people that the, the average schmuck from the street doesn't get to, doesn't get to meet, right? Because that's all I was as well in saying that you still want to be who you are and you, know, you can let it get to your head. I had some great advice from Ted Kenner, VC, who died 2009 and I got to see him just before and it was amazing to be able to share that moment with him before he passed on. He's a VC recipient from World War II. He was the only one left alive still at that time. And, you know, we did the media thing and the handshaking and that was great and then the cameras and all that. And then they left and Ted came to life. And we actually got to share a moment, just two, two soldiers so many years apart, just discussing things and just happened to be two guys with a Victoria Cross as well, right? But for me, it was the moment of two soldiers having a chat about life in the jungle or life in warfare and the things he got up to, the things we got up to. And, and the last thing he said to me was, you know, yeah, you got a Victoria Cross, but, but don't let it get to your head. How can, how can you go against someone like Ted Kenner, right? And, and, and that sort of advice. So, yeah, I've got to keep that in mind. That's, those things are important. Well, as you touched upon, you could have had the opportunity to wind down your active service with this new role, but you weren't done. You were still in the fight. And we'll get to a couple of specific deployment stories in a moment. But looking at the home front, when you started in the SAS, you just had your older brother back home. Now you have a wife, Emma, your daughter, Kaylee, who was very young when you got the VC. And then your young son, Hamish, comes along. How did having that young family back home affect your mindset when out in the field? For me, it didn't, for me, it didn't change my mindset whatsoever. That was my job. Life was on pause back home. Right. They understood the job I did. Did it change my decision making? Did it affect things for me? No, not so ever. Not one iota. I know some people they have families. They have that as soon as they have kids, it changes life. Right? Oh, everything's put into perspective, or you might do things differently. And I tell you, now that I'm a little bit older and I'm actually moved on from the regiment, the family at home now has more of an impact now than what it ever did back then. And does that mean I prioritise the job over the family? Not at all. However, I was over there and then the people that needed me to be switched on weren't the people sitting back at home. To a degree, yes, because I wanted to get back home and they wanted me home, certainly. Like that's an aspect of it. But the immediate effect were the people that were around me, the people in my team and the job we were there to do. So it's got to be like a switch and that's how I used to approach it, to switch. Uh, unfortunate, that's how I dealt with it. Does that create issues? Of course it does. Are they manageable? Yeah, they are. But my mates needed me to be at attention with the right attitude. And if I'm thinking about people back home when, when they're in the middle of a gunfight, then I'm not thinking about the right things. And, and when I get back to the base and I get time to switch off, then I can do that and I can worry about the family back home. But at that time for those period of months or for that mission or for that hour or for that minute, I need to not be thinking about them. So be it because there's other things that need to be done. A key figure in your post-VC deployments is Devil. Tell me more about him. The devil, yeah. Uh, one of the special operations canines. I'm extremely clever dog. Not the biggest dog, but you know, pretty clever. And I'm a little bit biased. But uh, special forces have, have dogs uh, that train up and the dogs are a little bit different. And we ask our dogs to do two different jobs. One is using their nose to find bombs, bullets, guns, etc. And the other one is using the skills that they bring to find people, right? To detain them, detect them, etc. Read into that what you will. Still an SAS operator. I still have that as my core job but I'm now a dog handler as well, which brings a, a level of force multiplication to our role, whether it's a small team, five blokes, four guys even, or it's a, it's a larger type of thing, right? In an assaulting type of role. There's a few other things that we get them to do. What was really important is about what it brings to the team. And then the team that we have together was really important. So that bond between dog and human is really, really special. I've always loved dogs. I've grown up with dogs. You know, dogs are just good fun. Cats are hilarious, but dogs are a lot more fun, right? But that being said, you're not going to take a cat to war. But it was about working so close together. And Devil was one of those dogs in particular that for me was kind of special because uh, we were going through a phase with our training with the dogs about wanting them to do this dual role. Devil had this unique ability to switch between, between those roles straight away. Now, we, we did a deployment together in 2011 um, where I was purely just looking after the dog and myself and evaluating where we could into those teams and, and you know, Many different examples of him saving Australian soldiers' lives, not only my own, but others, right? Talk me through an example. Yeah, well, we, we went into this one valley, uh, ended up being 13 hours of, you know, sustained fighting, but ended up fighting through this village, only 12 people through this huge, like quite a large village that, that was sparse of any vegetation. So it was really like house to house sort of stuff, different houses, obviously, but that's kind of what it was like. We were very, very spread out. So a lot of the times it was just myself and the dog or myself, one other operator and the dog clearing a whole house by ourselves. And we'd been, we got to a point where we were bumping into the enemy quite a bit now, right? And in close combat. Some of the other teams had some pretty serious engagements where they were dropping grenades through holes in the roof and they were getting shot at out through the roof. And they dealt with that eventually. And, and we come into this one area where myself and one other guy went in to clear out this, this house. I went one way, he went the other. And as he went into a small room, like a small little animal, 
enclosure uh, that was covered. He got engaged, right? And, and he ended up shooting one guy, but there was another guy in there as well. So they were kind of both um, on the mutually supporting sides of the doorway. Very small doorway they have to crouch down to get into. So he got one guy, but he didn't get the other and he backed out of it. We were in this fight, you know, shooting through the doorway at each other, myself, my teammate, uh, and the enemy guy in the, in the room. And the dog, my dog Devil, he kept going in this other room behind me, right? I had a little camera and I was watching the little picture on my little screen I had. I kept calling him back, calling him back because I thought he was just like breaking away and starting to do his own thing. I want to know where he is in a gunfight so he doesn't get caught up in the mix and doesn't get caught in the crossfire. And they're pretty well trained, but he kept breaking away. And in the end, I sort of, third time I went, I'll oh, bugger it. Go and do whatever you want to do then, mate. Because I was trying to worry about this guy in this room with my mate and dealing with this, this problem right here. And then I look down, I hear this noise and I look down on the camera and I see he's got a hold of someone, right? And I see that he had a gun. And, and so now, you know, things have changed. Not only we're exchanging gunfire with one guy who's only a couple of meters away in a room, Behind me is this other guy who had a gun who's now the dog found and started to drag him out, right? And from the dog's safety and my own safety, you know, I engaged that guy and managed to, to, to um, you know, neutralize that threat, kill him. But if it wasn't for him, right, either that guy would have got, got out and shot me in my back without me knowing about it or the minute we walked into that room you know, where he was at, where the dog had actually dragged him out from, you know, we wouldn't have seen that guy when we walked through and you know, my head would have been down because of the small doorways and things and, and you know, he would have got us. When you're potentially such a small group, the dogs just so greatly enhance your capability this way. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, you know, their sense of smell is 40,000 times stronger than ours. The hearing's better than ours. The way they track movement is better than ours with their eyes. So there's an element there that they bring that we just can't add. There's an element that they bring that drones can't bring or that technology can't bring. You know, it's getting closer, but it's not there yet. Not there yet. And Devil, he really understood what his job was. I mean, there's a case where he discovered a couple of small children under the bed and he knew, oh, no, they're not combatants. I'm not going to attack them. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, it's interesting you bring that up. Not many people do because they just want to hear about all the fun stuff, right? Um, all the bullets and the, the engagements. But there's elements like that. I mean, we train these dogs ridiculous times, right? And we're there early mornings. We're there late at night when everyone else has gone home doing all this training. Four examples like that, you know. He went into this room. His job is to find the people in there before us, right? Now, he, he came across some kids underneath the blankets, been through the training, but smart enough also to understand that this doesn't fit the picture. Like, this isn't the picture that he's been given that he's used to. These, they're small. They're not threatening. Right? Obviously, had a smell of it and realized there wasn't any weapons there either. Right? So, but enough to know that that wasn't the right thing to bite. But there's two things to that. One, he's done the right thing. Right? But two, he's also protected us because in the sense that I now understand that there's someone there or there's something there. So when I go in there and looking at the way that the dog's behaving, right, that gives me an indication. We're communicating through visual signs of the way he's looking at that picture to know that it's not a threat as well, right? So that changes the way I approach that situation as well or my teammates approach that situation because they, they understand what the dog's doing as well. So not only lifesavers for us, but also lifesavers for the enemy as well. Everything we do, we treat them like another soldier, not only in the training, jumping out of planes with them, going on the helicopters with them, underslinging, all those sorts of things. But we treat them like any one of us. So it's not frivolous. We're not throwing their lives away. We don't just chuck them into situations. And sadly, you eventually have to hand Devil off to a new owner. Yeah, exactly. Um, one of the hardest things I had to do but was separate us as the team because I had to move on and you know, he still had a career to have. And that, that ended up being with another good mate of mine, really good mate, who I feel really I feel for because, you know, and there's two things to this, um, I feel really bad for because you know, he got the dog which was awesome. But he had to go through that process of, of losing an animal who was killed in action, right? Because Devil got killed. In that same action, Sergeant Blaine did him, got killed. I, was, I feel really, really bad for him because I felt it as well, but I didn't have him at the time. And extremely difficult. Not just for you, but for the whole team. Right, not just for me, for the whole team. Um, they affect the whole team. They think about their dogs back home. It, it brings a sense of, I don't know, humanity is not the right word but it normality normality maybe yeah it brings to the team like that and to know that the dog's on their side right and they can give them a bit of a tickle behind the ear what they bring to the party is they they do it because they love it and there's a big difference there so it's hard losing one of them when was your last overseas deployment with the sas and why was it the last i guess the last combat deployment was 2012 it was my last because that was the rotation. That was just the way they worked out went back overseas very shortly in 2013 but not so much in a fighting role and, and that one was a, a bit of a ball terror as well, if I can put it into those terms, because because of a few things. Yeah, it was very, very active. 11 and 12 were both very, very active. Lots of contacts, lots of contact with the enemy, lots of targeted operations. In the sort of final, well, on that, the final day, probably the crappiest in 2012 anyway for that trip, uh, was because we had uh, killed in action uh, Sergeant Blaine Didhams, who got a medal for gallantry as well during his action. 
Uh, but also my dog devil wasn't my dog on that day, but you know, my dog, I say my dog that we'd uh, been utilizing in the last few years, who was also killed in that exact same uh, action. So after that last deployment, you go into a directing staff role within the regiment. You eventually phase out of it. What have you been doing since? Yeah. So just before I phased out, I, I went and joined a part of the regiment uh, that provides a lot of the training. And, and the reason I did that was because I wanted to give something back. Um, I felt that. You know, I was at a point where I was really interested in training the new guys that were coming through, right? A couple of mates were looking at better ways of doing things, changing the way we train our guys. Super interesting, you know, focusing a lot on the brain and behaviors and pre-combat veterans and, you know, lots of other really cool words. But it was the way we're doing it, the methodology that we're using. Not so much the, the shooting or the vehicle that we used to get there, the CQB training and things like that. It was the way we did it. About just changing the way the military trains in general. And, and you know, are we going to change the way the military trains? No, but we can affect what we can affect, which was the way we trained our guys. We wanted a better product sooner with better behaviors at the end of it. And that's that's what you know I managed to do before I phased out. Another couple of years over here on the East Coast you know, doing stuff with the military and then uh, yeah, got out. Uh, what I've been doing since then was was reconnecting with family, reconnecting with friends and reconnecting with all the things that, that I used to do before a job in the Special Forces and SAS in particular consumes your life with. So surfing, adventure travel, just enjoying things. Right, without having to think about work so much, um, which you know led to a few opportunities. Uh, I got to be an assistant manager with the New South Wales Blues. Unfortunately, they didn't win the series, but that's all right. It was a good experience, and I made some great, great mates that were outside the military. Right, um, some of those footy players and and the coaching staff who you know I would call friends again, which is important to have people outside of the military for someone who's transitioning out. You got to have a wide variety of people to be able to connect with. And more recently, I've just joined. Uh, I've just been hired by Boeing uh, Aerospace, so I work for Boeing now. In particular, in strategic development and advice to defense. But, you know, Boeing is uh, an amazing company, a big company, so it obviously has its own problems. But the thing that I like about it and, and the thing that I think is good about it was that it's, it has good people in it and they have the best interest at heart of those they're trying to provide product for. I didn't really care what they did, didn't really care about the money. Got to provide for my family now, so that's certainly important. But the bigger aspect of it for me was, you know, how they treated each other. And if you're looking at similarities, and I'm not trying to find, because nothing will replace a job in the Special Air Service Regiment. It just won't. So why compare it? But many things that I liked about it, one of the things that I really liked about it was the way people came together as a team. It's the way people looked after each other and the way that they wanted to get on and achieve some stuff. And, and that was the similarity I saw with Boeing. And, you know, if things go well, that's, that's where it'll move forward with them and I'll be with them for a while. This September will be the 10-year anniversary of the day you performed the actions that got you the VC. There you go. You've been a Victoria Cross recipient for almost a decade. With all that time having passed, what does being a VC recipient mean to you today and what do you think it means to the public? <laughs> there you go. I didn't even realise it's been 10 years almost as I don't think about it like that. That's a really, really good question. And I could probably answer this completely different on, on, on any other given day. There's a few core things that I think won't change and... I think being a Victoria Cross recipient, one of the things that's always going to, to be there is the Victoria Cross. One thing I had to learn is that it's always going to be there. Now, I can try and run and hide and avoid it, but it'll always be there. I might not do anything with it for the rest of my life, and that's fine. However, what it means to be a Victoria Cross recipient is that there's now an extra level of responsibility that comes with that award. There's an extra level of integrity. There's an extra level of understanding that it means a lot more to other people than what it can to yourself even sometimes. Now, it's deeply personal. It's my team and my own experience that we went through. Small select group of people, right? That, you know, I, I happen to be singled out for what I did and I now have that. No one else has experienced that in the world. Their own experiences and similar awards, right? But not that one in particular. So for me, I, there's two things to it. I need to be really, really conscious that there was other people there that day. And that's really important because it's not just about me and it's not just about the Victoria Cross. However, there is a level of importance that comes with it. So I don't want to defame that, defile that, bring it down in any way through my own lack of judgment, hopefully. What does it mean to people? I think it means it's a symbol of, of courage. It truly is the representation of what it was designed for. It is courage beyond conception to a degree. Truth is stranger than fiction. You read some of these things and you just go, wow, how did that ever happen, right? How do they get through that? Or sometimes they don't. But what does it mean to people? It means something different to everybody. For an example, when I first was given the award, I was in a, down the street in Canberra. People were recognizing me, bizarre, but it meant something different to everyone. And one lady came up to me and said, and she was in tears and she was crying and gave me a hug and said, this means so much to my, my dad, I think it was, or a granddad, sorry, who served to see something like this, you know. That affected them in a different way. 
Um, I've had other people come up to me and say things that you, you've given me so much courage with your own story and your own life and the things you've gone through and the fact that you've also gone over and got that Victoria Cross, which has made me get off the drugs. It's made me get back into school. It's made me change my life. It's made me become a better father. It's made me become a better mother. I had one kid recently that he came and, and I was doing a bit of a talk and he came and listened to my talk and he was a homeless, he wasn't, well, he was a homeless kid, but he was at school, you know, on the edges of deciding whether to go off the rails or, or do his studies and he'd been through his own personal trauma and you know because he, he just happened to be there at that night and hear what I had to say he changed his life around now for me what does it mean to the public you know I could go a bit much and say it's a symbol of hope but I think it's a symbol of discipline it's a symbol of it's a symbol of valor it's a symbol of making a choice it's a funny duality you're in there then because you've said it's not about you it's this ultimate symbol of courage symbol of hope but the public has also made you specifically, Mark, a symbol. You're not just wearing one. And you quite rightly say it's not just about me. There were others there that day. You were one of a team. And you've got to live with the balance of it's both the medal and the man wearing it. Yeah, right, 100%. And here's the thing, right? And I mean, I learned earlier on, when you see a Victoria Cross without any words on the back of it, it's just a medal. There's nothing special about it. It's actually a really crappy metal. And you talk to the people that work with it and they, you know, their stories about how annoying it is and how hard it is because of the, the type of metal that it is. There's nothing special about it. It looks good. Right? I'll, I'll give it that. It's a really good looking metal, but it is plain. Next to shiny, flashier metals, it's really, really plain. The thing that makes it special is when you flip it over and there's someone's name on it and the date that they got that, and that dates back to 1856 in some cases. That is what makes it special. It becomes personal. Getting back to your point, right? That's the thing that a Victoria Cross recipient has to live with because your name's on the back of that. So it is personal. Yet the front of it, it's the world. It is a strange duality that you have to live with. Processing that is, is everyone's different journey. Well, part of that journey of reflection was, of course, your book. Before I outright plug your autobiography, <laughs> I do have to disclose to listeners Thank that you. I worked on it as a Pam McMillan employee. The Crossroad, a story of life, death, and the SAS. What inspired you to write it? I had this moment where I just said to my wife, it feels like the right time. It feels like the right time to put this out because a lot of people wanted to know about the story. They wanted to know about the cross. And I felt it doesn't really matter how many times you tell it. It's, it's, for me, they felt like there was so much more to my life. I had so much more to tell than just that one event. There's lots of things that make up a person before they do something. And that's what I wanted to tell. Well, she asked me, why are you doing this? And I said, well, if I sell a thousand copies or I sell one copy, it doesn't really matter. As long as one person picks that book up and they put it down, they go, that was excellent. I want to go and do something different with my life. I don't need to stay on this path that seems like a path that's not going to get them anywhere, however they perceive that to be, right? And she said, if that happens, would that make you happy? I said, well, if that happens, I would see that as a successful book. And also, I wanted it to be a book that people would put on the bookshelf. Someone would come around and go, what's that? And they would hand it to them. They say, go and read this. Or they might come back to it year after year and have scribbled through it and put some pencils and underlines around things and related it to their own life that, that made them just reflect on things and go, well, I can see where I should have done something differently or I can now make a better decision or I can really relate to that and then want to, again, go and become a better version. If I managed to do that with it, then that was the whole reason for it. Well, as it's shown through this conversation today, you're obviously you know, well used to telling your story by now, but how did you find at the time the experience of documenting your life, reflecting and committing it to paper? It was, uh, it was strange, again, because we don't talk about it, right? We don't talk about it. If we talk about the book itself, one of the things that was really important was I didn't want it to be a military book. Now, I don't know whether that's successful or not. In my eyes, it is. And the guys that assisted in writing it, Pam McMillan and the rest, right? But, but we're really, really good in understanding that. It was not to be a military book. Now, what I mean by that is I wanted someone who knew nothing about war, who knew nothing about being a soldier to assist with it because they're going to bring a point of view that it just is what it is. Right? And then they'll tell it like that. So for me to be able to sit down with the particular author that helped me with it and tell my story uh, and then him give that back to me and go, right, oh, it's yours now. And I'll give Malcolm Knox props because he's the one who helped me out. And he's an awesome guy. He certainly is. He's written some amazing things around sport because that's his thing, right? There's something with, with Malcolm that he just he was just happy to listen right? and then rationalize it. There was no spin from him. There was no, oh, I'm a military historian, so I know what war's about. Or I'm a military journalist, so I know what war's about, right? Uh, and he wouldn't bring any of those biases with him. And that for me was really important. And to that, I think the book did reach and touch a lot of people. It did exceptionally well, a national bestseller, and the Australian Book Industry Awards named it Biography of the Year 2014. 
And listeners, you can find a copy in Australian bookstores and online because I encourage you all to look it up, not just for my job, but because of all the reasons Mark's touched on in our chat today. I know you may not see yourself as a hero, Mark, but a lot of people listening will. Do you have a message for anyone who is looking up to you, who's in the Defence Force or who may want to join? Uh, yeah, um, I get asked this a lot uh, and, and I don't mean to demean the question, but I, and I, again, I'll answer this 10 different ways uh, depending on the day you catch me, right? But one thing doesn't really change. If you want to join, you're going to be doing it. You have to want to do it because you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself because you're going to go through things that it's going to ask you to sacrifice a lot and that sacrifice will come above your own personal well-being and it'll come above sometimes your own family's well-being and it really truly is about service above self. If you can understand that it's all about the team, it's going to help that journey. I would say you got to truly want it. So really look inside and really think about what it is that you want and sometimes people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear what is it that you want, what do you want to do? Sometimes you don't know. And you've got to go through a journey like that to figure that out. If that's the case, give it a crack is what I would say. Go and give it a crack because it put more into it because the more you put into it, the more it will give back. And Mark, where can listeners find you on social media? I, I am active. Um, I don't like social media that much. but One of those necessary evils. Apparently, right. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly active on Instagram uh, at Mark Donaldson VC. If they want to reach out and say hello or, you know, I'll certainly do the best I can. I don't get everyone straight away, but uh, I'll do what I can. Well, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an honour and a great conversation. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it, Alex. That was my conversation with Mark Donaldson, VC. Look up The Crossroad online and get yourself a copy for a truly breathtaking memoir. Look us up online too. You can follow this podcast on Facebook and Instagram at Life on the Line Podcast and on Twitter at LOTL Pod. Email us at podcast at lifeonthelinepodcast.com and find out more at www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. If you enjoyed the episode and have a moment, please leave us a five-star rating and review in Apple Podcasts. It really helps us reach more people to spread these inspiring Australian stories of service to a wider audience. You can also share this podcast on social media and tell your friends. My warm thanks go to the Cronulla Golf Club for hosting us, and again to Mark for coming on the podcast. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design, music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thank you for listening, and lest we forget...